So Jesus said there'll be trouble. And there has been trouble in the early church and there's trouble in the world today. We're in a study of the early church, the book of Acts. And the first thing that happened was that Jesus told them to wait in Jerusalem for the coming of the Holy Spirit. And then in chapter two, the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost, at which time they were empowered to share the good news with the whole world. And uh, 2,000 people were saved. And then last week, we looked at how the church was functioning. They witnessed, they healed, they shared their possessions, the people were saved, things were going along great. And now we come to chapter five, and it's sort of a rude awakening about the early church because there's trouble. There's trouble in the church, there's trouble outside the church, there's trouble all around. Jesus predicted that it would happen, and the disciples um, were discovering it for themselves. And that's where we pick up the story of, of, of what we're working on this week, this month. Okay, if you will, get out your bare notes. <clears throat> and we're going to look inside there at four different aspects of, of the chapters that we're looking at today, five through seven. And so let's just jump right into number one, which is trouble on the inside, trouble on the inside. And so within the church, the sin, uh, sin developed inside the church, and it's a, kind of a tragic story, and we're going to look at that first. Now, a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. And with his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has filled your heart so that you've lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think that doing, of doing such a thing? <clears throat> you've not lied to the human beings, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died, and great fear seized all those who heard what had happened. Oh, my this is what happened there in the early church in chapter 5 as the first sin enters the church family. Now, people were being very generous at that time. They were sharing their money and possessions and that sort of thing to care for the needs of the poor, to help advance the kingdom of God, to make sure that the gospel could be shared with uh, far and wide. And then some of the people started giving some major gifts People started selling extra property that they had and bringing the proceeds to the apostles to advance the cause of Christ. Barnabas, you remember Barnabas in the New Testament, he's mentioned like 30 times and became the, you know, the partner of Paul. Barnabas, which means the encourager, he sold a farm that he owned and brought the whole value to the apostles. So let's put it in today's terms. So let's say that in the past, people had bringing their, bring, bringing their gifts, $100, $1,000, $10,000, that sort of thing. But now some people are actually selling huge plots of land and farms and that sort of thing and bringing these huge gifts. As an example, let's say that Barnabas sold his real estate and brought the entire amount of $300,000. So now there are these huge, some of these huge gifts are coming into the church family. Everybody was so excited. Well, then apparently Ananias and Sapphira decided that they could sort of one-up Barnabas and they sold their real estate for, let's say, $700,000. And it was way more than the, the largest gift that had ever come in before, say at three hundred. dollars and so, but rather than giving the whole amount, they decided they would say that they were giving the whole amount, but they would keep 200,000 uh, uh, cash in their, in their pockets and then still bring a half million dollar offering. And they would say to each other, you know, we're, we have brought the largest offering in the history of Christianity. We're going to go down in history as the greatest givers ever. Well, apparently, you know, the word of their lie got out. And, and there was no need for them to lie the apostles to the church. I mean, it was their money. They could have done whatever they wanted to. But they decided to parade themselves around as the greatest believers, you know, ever to live. But it was a lie. And when confronted, Ananias just died. He just fell down dead. And his wife did the same thing. Now, it doesn't necessarily say that God killed them. But when they were confronted, apparently the shame and the guilt was just too much to bear, and down they went. And did you catch that part of the first where it, verse where it says, great fear seized them all. God is not to be trifled with. As C.S. Lewis portrayed in Chronicles of Narnia, Jesus as a lion, 
C.S. Lewis said, God is not a tame lion. George MacDonald wrote, half of the misery in the world comes from trying to look instead of trying to be what one is not. Now, this whole story is kind of a weird one, but it's considered to be the first sin in the church, and there was a tragic result. Not unlike the first sin of humanity in the Garden of Eden, eating the one tree that God said not to eat from. And that sin turned loose evil on our world. And now the people realize that sin against God's people brings tragedy. And so it's every believer's responsibility, you know, to keep their hearts true to the Lord. Well, that's the first step in this story, in beginning in chapter 5. And so let's move on to number 2. There's trouble inside, but number 2, there's trouble on the outside. There's trouble on the outside. And so what's going on here? Then the high priest and all his associates, who were members of the party of the Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. And they arrested the apostles and put them in public jail. But during the night... An angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people about this new life. Now, what a story here. So they were arrested. It says the apostles were arrested. It doesn't actually say which ones. Peter was a part of the group, but it doesn't say how many apostles, but but several of them at least. And... um, We're going to see this same story happen over and over in the book of Acts, that the apostles get arrested and put in jail and beaten for their beliefs and that sort of thing. You know, in many cases, people's politics and religion are the two things that people can get most upset about. You know what I'm talking about? But of the two, even religion is even the highest level of emotion and opinion. And so wherever the Christians go and preach Jesus, there are people who will oppose them because, because somebody's messing with their religion, right? And they get really upset. Well, the Jewish leaders thought that they had solved the problem of Jesus by executing him. But guess what? Jesus is back. And he, and he met with hundreds of his followers after the resurrection. And now he's living inside all those who name the name of the Lord. And so what are they going to do? It's not just one Jesus now. Now there's like thousands of little Jesuses running around. And so they arrested some of the apostles. Well, the grave could not hold back Jesus, and this jail cell could not hold back Jesus' followers. And so in the night, an angel came and let them out. And I love that Luke records here in Acts what the message of the angel was. I mean, we'd all like to have an angel come and give us a message, right? Well, He did to them. He gave them a message. And what was the message? Go stand in the temple courts and tell the people about this new life. It's like another version of the Great Commission. The Great Commission is mentioned in in, uh, all of the uh, writers of of uh, of the Gospels. Go and make disciples of all nations. The Father has sent me as the Father has sent me, so send I you. You are witnesses of these things. You shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the world. And now there's one more from an angel. Go and tell the people about this new life. And so then um, the next morning they went and checked in the jail. They were gone. The police came back and reported to the Sanhedrin. Um, sorry, but they're not in the jail anymore. And then somebody said, you know where they are? They're back in the temple preaching again about Jesus. And so this time they went up and politely asked them to come and meet with the Sanhedrin. <clears throat> and uh, because they were, you know, there's a crowd all around them who loved hearing what they said. Now, the, the Jewish leaders of the Sanhedrin wanted to kill them. They killed Jesus to silence him. And now they wanted to kill his followers to silence them. But an interesting thing happened. The most famous member of the Sanhedrin, Gamaliel, whose teachings are still widely followed today, said that there had been other supposed uh, messiahs that had come along, and a few people followed him, but then it just kind of faded away. And then Gamaliel said, so this is probably going to happen with Jesus' followers too. But if it's for real, he said to the Sanhedrin, you could find yourselves fighting against God himself. And so they sort of stood down. So the Sanhedrin council was attacking the truth, 
The apostles were proclaiming the truth, and Gamaliel was avoiding the truth. It never says that Gamaliel really researched this to try to find out whether it was true or not. He just said, why don't we just stand down and let it play itself out? The Jewish leaders did not seem interested in finding out what God had for them. But that didn't stop the disciples from continuing to take the message of Jesus to everybody they could find. Well, let's move on to number three here. The third part of our story is that there was trouble with the organization. All right, we've looked at the sin problem. We've looked at the persecution problem. Now there's an organizational issue that they face in the church. And this gives us a lot of help in just understanding how these things work. So we're reading in, uh, now in Acts 6, verses 1 through 4. In those days, when the number of disciples, and the word disciple just means the believers, in those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. And so the 12 gathered all the disciples together and said this. They said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. So brothers and sisters, choose seven men among you who are known to be full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, and we will turn this responsibility over to them and we'll give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. So we get to see an actual situation where they're solving a problem in their church situation and developing an organization to be able to handle it. Now, being a widow in that day was a precarious state. The whole society operated under a patriarchal culture where men were in charge of everything. So that meant that children were under the leadership and protection of their fathers. Wives were under the protection of their husbands. But what about widows? They had nobody. And so they were just left out in society. Some of them would be taken in by some family members if they had any. Otherwise, there was nobody to fend for them. And so many of them just became beggars in their lives. So it was a difficult situation to live. Now, naturally, when the church was instituted at Pentecost, one of the very first things they did was to set up a ministry to take care of all the new Christian widows. But a problem developed. There were two groups of people here. Remember, they had all come from Pentecost, so they had come from all around the world. And so some of them were Hebraic Jews who lived right there and who spoke Hebrew or Aramaic, the, the common language of the, of the Hebrew people at that time. And then there were others, some who lived there, some were, uh, that, that were from other countries, who were Greek-speaking Hebrews who now had become Christians, who had become a part of this family. And so you've got the Greek speakers and you've got the Aramaic speakers. Now, When environments change, then systems need to change to address the new situation. So what did they do? They said, choose seven men to deal with this. Now, this is interesting. In in our culture, we talk about, in volunteer organizations, a lot about committees. But we don't have any committees here at Bear Valley. We have teams. Now, I, I always thought that was sort of a semantic issue, but it's not a semantic issue at all. Committees are designed, I mean, this is kind of the way it came about in Robert's Rules of Order, is that committees are designed to handle political issues. And so in committees, you get, you know, half the people from one faction and half the people from another faction, put them together and say, see if you guys can come to some kind of compromise about the situation. And that's why you're supposed to have in committees an odd number of people so somebody can break the tie. So you get together, you fight it out, and then one person gets to break the tie. Just like Congress, right? Just like the Senate. Okay, same deal. Now, a team is a whole different concept. What is the goal of a team? A goal of a committee is to find compromise and settle on on some kind of policy. A team is to make a touchdown, okay? That's what teams do. They're, they're trying to go out there and do something. Let's go fight, fight for what is right. Let's go fulfill the ministry. Let's go minister to the people. That's what teams are about. So in our church, we just do the teams. We're just trying to deal with something and make it happen and fulfill a ministry. And that's what happened there. He said, okay, choose seven men. The apostles just told the church, you guys just pick seven. You know, figure out a way to pick seven. Now, what's interesting, it lists the names in here. All seven names are Greek names. So they didn't pick a single person from the 
Hebraic side of the, uh, of the, of the community. These Greek widows were the ones that felt they were being uh, left out. And so all seven of them speak Greek and would be able to handle their situation and uh, be able to solve the food problem. Now, the apostles already had a full-time ministry. They were already using their time in the ministries of teaching and prayer and disciple-making and witnessing and that sort of thing. So now these seven other guys, they developed a new ministry. And you know there were lots of people that volunteered to help out because uh, in a food ministry, um, you know, when you realize something's as critical as food, it's, um, there's always people who will step forward and make sure that there's enough food to go around. <clears throat> and so this is what the church has been doing ever since. When there's a need, you just figure out how to fix the need, how to, how to figure out a way to solve the problem. You just put a team together and make it happen. The text says that they were complaining about the situation. I guess the apostle said, you know, let's not sit around and complain about it. Let's find a solution to this. Remember about the murmuring in the wilderness? Remember that whole deal? These these poor people came out of Egypt. They had all been slaves. They they were not people who, who generally were able to solve the problem because they were slaves. They were under the foot of, um, of the po- political and, and powerful leaders and the, and the military. And so they, they knew how to complain, but there was no way to ever solve the problem because they didn't have the power to solve it. Well, now, you know, God says, okay, now you're free. You can solve your own problems. You don't have to just complain about them. You can actually do something. And so it seems like the same thing is happening here. There's murmuring in the wilderness. And... Um, you know, if you think about today, all the churches and all the ministries that have been started by every church that's ever happened in history, there would be no way to count these. I mean, there are so many ministries that have been started by churches. Every church in every town has started a variety of ministries to meet the needs of that community and the world. And if you put all those together, there would be billions and billions of ministries that have been started just like this. You get a team together and you say, here's our challenge. Let's figure out how to make this food service work and a team will make it happen. The way to solve any problem, you clarify the need, you communicate the need, and then you work patiently to meet the need. I, um, I got an email from Pastor Junior in India uh, a couple of days ago. And he told about a new ministry that they're working on. I don't really quite understand it, but here's, here's the drift of what I get from it. Is that there are people in his community who had to have some kind of surgical procedure, but they didn't have the money to pay for it. So apparently there are some bad actors who said, yeah, we'll pay for your surgery if you will enter sort of an indentured servitude type situation and pay it off by working for the next seven years or whatever. But a lot of these people are being pushed into the sex trade. And so Pastor Junior is trying to develop a team to figure out how can we help break some of these people free from this mafia-like environment out there. Well, these are the kind of things that people face in our world. And Christians figure out a way to solve the problem, put a group together, figure out the need, and find a way to solve the issue. Well, that was the problem of organization, and they worked, and apparently things worked out because we don't hear any more about problems about that. Now, one more is trouble unto death, number four. Trouble unto death. And here, we're going to see the first story of a Christian being killed for their faith. Now, Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it is called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia, who began to argue with Stephen, but they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. And then they secretly persuaded some men to say, we have heard Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And now we're going to skip down to verse 58 of chapter 7. And the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. And while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then he fell to his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. The first martyr 
of the Christian church. Jesus said there was going to be trouble. And we, when he said that, I don't know if the disciples really believed at that time that they were going to start killing the followers of Jesus. But Stephen was the first. Today, on average, 16 Christians are martyred every single day. 12 churches are burned down in our world. 17 Christians are arrested or taken away. And in the last 100 years, over 30 million Christians have been martyred, which is more than all the other 19 centuries combined. It was the synagogue of the freedmen, Luke says in Acts, who sought to stop Stephen from sharing his faith. Now it's interesting, where did these people come from? It says they were from Cyrene. That's in the modern day country of Libya. It says they were from Alexandria. That was the second city of the Roman Empire. Rome being the first one at that time, Alexandria was the the second most important city, which is of course in Egypt. And then Asia, it's actually talking about a province of Asia, not the continent, which is the area around Ephesus in Turkey, modern day Turkey. And then Cilicia, which is the region where the capital city is Tarsus the hometown of the Apostle Paul. Okay, so Paul was probably a member of the synagogue of the freedmen, and he may well have been the one who was debating with Stephen, trying to take down Stephen. Well, they couldn't win the debates with him, and so they paid people off to be false witnesses against Stephen. And, and, I, and I've noticed this in life in general. You've noticed it too that when people have such strongly held beliefs that serve at the core of their identity, values that determine who they are in their soul, they will do anything to defend those values, even if it means lying and cheating and injuring and killing those who they oppose. And that's exactly what the synagogue of the freedmen were doing. They paid people off to bring false witness against Stephen and saying, and, and, and bring to the court, to the Sanhedrin, that... Um, Stephen is saying things uh, that he hates God. Okay. So these Jewish leaders, and probably Paul, wanted to win an accusation against him that they could use as a precedent. If they could win this precedent one time, then they could take the same court ruling and they could go to people everywhere and bring them in and stone them for their faith. Bring in false witnesses, set them up, stir up the people, execute. That was the plan. And so what did Stephen say when they started throwing the stones. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold these sins against them. This may have been the moment. This may have been the moment when Saul, the oppressor, realized that there's something different about these Christians. He knew about using force to hurt people. He knew about um, protecting his religion in such a way that he would be willing to kill or injure people to protect that. And here's Stephen saying, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. This may have been the moment when Saul started thinking, I wonder what we're dealing with here. It's different than anything that I've ever seen in my life. And it wasn't long after that that the persecuted himself, Saul, ended up becoming the leader of the Christian movement of the world. 400 years later, St. Augustine wrote, if St. Stephen had not spoken thus, and if he had not prayed thus, the church would not have had the Apostle Paul. There will always be trouble in the church. Our world is a mixture of trouble and blessing. And until Jesus comes back and sets everything aright, our job is to keep on loving people. Our job is to keep on living for the Lord. Our job is to keep on fulfilling our calling to bring the message of hope and love to people all around the world. Jim Elliott, one of the famous missionaries who went to bring Christ to the primitive Warani Indians in South South America, He knew that it was extremely dangerous. He knew that the Warani people had killed every other visitor who'd come from the outside. And they killed him at age 28. But his wife and friends, as you know the story, they went back and they shared with the Warani people and ultimately those people came to Jesus Christ and met him as their Lord and Savior. But Jim Elliott had written this in his journal. 
I seek not a long life, but a full one like you, Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Our Father, we realize there's been trouble related to believers throughout history. And Lord, we live in some crazy times. And we don't always know how to react or respond or or deal with the issues that confront us. But you do. And we know that our job is just keep living for you, keep you at the forefront, and keep loving people. Let us do that. And let us navigate our way through the trouble that will always come. But we will trust in you. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.